three, two, one. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, Fair Chance and Housing Act one year anniversary webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping rules. So you're able to know how to participate in today's event. This program will be recorded. And given this is a webinar, guests will not be able to be seen on camera. Nonetheless, as an audience, you have access to drop questions in the Q&A tab, and you have the option to submit questions anonymously. All audience members, cameras, and microphones will be off as well. Due to time constraints, we ask that you keep the questions on topic. Please note that questions we do not get to this afternoon will be answered as a follow-up post-event. Should you have any additional questions, please feel free to email us at communityrelations at njcivilrights.gov. Resource links and contact information will also be shared in the chat throughout the program. If you experience any technical difficulties today, please explain your problem through the chat feature and we will try our best to address the issue. Lastly, please follow Division on Civil Rights on Facebook and Twitter at Civil Rights NJ for the latest information on news resources from our offices. I now turn it over to our moderator, Kai Durant. Hello, everyone. Um, welcome and thank you to join us for our one year anniversary of the Fair Chance and Housing Act. To start off the lunch and learn, I'd like to turn it over to the New Jersey Division and Civil Rights Director, Sandeep Iyer. Thank you so much, Kai. Uh, thank you everyone for being here and a special thanks to our team here at DCR for putting together this fantastic event. Nearly a third of the United States' adult population has a criminal history, and many of these individuals have been denied housing, uh, even though most pose no threat to their communities based on their criminal record alone. Criminal history screenings have disproportionately impacted communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, individuals, with disabilities and so many others. Fortunately, here in New Jersey, on Juneteenth, 2021, Governor Murphy signed the Fair Chance and Housing Act into law. That law generally bars housing providers from asking about criminal history on housing applications in most instances. The FCHA is the first state law of its kind in the country, and it's intended to ensure that people with past criminal histories have a fair shot at accessing safe and affordable housing. The law went into effect January, 2022, and I'm incredibly proud of the work that our team here at DCR has done to educate communities across the state on the law and to enforce the law. We've passed on information about the law across the state through the work of our community relations unit and in partnership with the Department of Corrections. And we've engaged in meaningful enforcement of this law. We've initiated over 80 enforcement actions against housing providers who violated the law in the first year of this law alone. And we're gonna to continue to enforce this law to ensure that individuals with criminal histories don't face unlawful discrimination. Today's program, as you can tell from the title, celebrates the one year anniversary of the law. It's going to highlight the important changes the law made to eliminate discrimination in housing and to ensure that every single New Jersey resident has a fair chance to obtain housing. The program will provide an overview of the steps individuals can take to file an FCHA complaint with the Division on Civil Rights and some of the resources available through DCR. Thank you all again for being here, and I now have the pleasure of turning it back over to our moderator, Community Relations Specialist, Kai Durant. Thank you, Director Iyer. I just want to say once again, thank you all for joining us today for our Lunch and Learn. Hopefully you have your lunches, so we're going to bring the learning part of it to you. Um, as they have said, I am the moderator. My name is Kai Durant. I am a Community Relations Specialist with the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. We're going to have a panel discussion, and afterwards we'll have time for questions and answers. So first of all, I'm going to start by introducing our panelists. Um, we will have Mr. James Williams, who is the Director of Racial Justice 
access policy at the Fair Share Housing Center. In addition, we will have Ms. Jessica Lane, who is a Fair Chance and Housing Act legal specialist at the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. And lastly, we will have Mr. Jonathan Green, who is the lead community mediator at the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights. So to start off our conversation and discussion, discussion I'm Jessica, um, what is the Fair Chance and Housing Act? Thank you, Kai. Thank you, um, Director Ayer. I appreciate all your interest in the work that we're doing here at DCR to all our um, panel participants here and all the uh, thank you to all the people who are worked with in partnership with DCR to in, bring this law about and in the enforcement of this law as well. So as our director noted, this is essentially an anti-discrimination law that sets forth the legal framework by which housing providers can fairly consider a housing applicant's criminal history in making a determination of housing eligibility. And the goal of the Fair Chance and Housing Act to is, ensure, in, to, is to ensure that formerly incarcerated individuals and system-involved people have fair access to housing around the state. The Fair Chance and Housing Act prohibits housing providers from asking about a rental applicant's criminal history on an initial applicant application for housing or otherwise considering an applicant's criminal history until after a conditional offer for housing has been made to the applicant. There are two limited considerations to this, um, whereby the housing provider can, on an initial application, ask whether or not the individual has been uh, convicted for the production or distribution of methamphetamine on federally assisted premises or whether they're subject to a lifetime registration requirement in a state sex offender program. Um, apart from those two limited exceptions, a housing provider does not consider a person's criminal history until after a conditional offer for housing has been made. And specific restrictions apply and the housing provider must provide notice through a disclosure statement that the housing provider will be considering criminal history, and then the applicant has a right to present evidence of inaccuracies, evidence of mitigation and rehabilitation to the housing provider. The housing provider must also conduct an individualized assessment of the applicant's criminal history and may only deny housing if withdrawing a conditional offer is necessary to fulfill a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest. So while this law does provide for quite a few different procedural elements, each protection is in place to ensure that applicants for housing are fairly considered in the eligibility determination. Thank you, Ms. Lane. Um, my next question, I will ask Mr. Williams, why is in, in this um, record-based exclusion um, essential to fair housing for all? Uh, great question, and thank you guys for having me. Apologies for my uh, my tardiness. Um, just understanding that there, there's there's long been a link to to, to factors uh, that that are primarily like anchored towards certain communities, right? So, New Jersey not too long ago um, passed legislation to remove um, to restore the right to vote for those that, um, that had criminal records, right? So we separated the democratic process from the criminal justice system. Now, this piece of legislation looks to do the same. We want to look to separate the criminal justice system from your right to housing. Um, and, and a fair share, you know, we, we leave with the statement that, you know, housing is a fundamental right. Um, and if you talk to, um, in DCR, you guys are, um, in this space, when you talk to individual individual going to be if they don't have housing when returning from incarceration, um, the likelihood of them recidivating, you know, multiplies exponentially without that access to housing. Um, so we see this as an opportunity to create back end, you know, recognizing that this individual has already been through the system, how do we create back-end programs, back-end policy that allows for individuals to, to return home and stay home? And if you've, you know, if you've ever talked to someone that has been in one of these spaces that has been incarcerated, they probably usually lead with housing. If it's a mother and she wants to regain access to her children and her family, one of the first things that a, a judge or a caseworker is going to ask, do you have safe and secure housing? 
Um, so this becomes a, a primary tool for success for formerly incarcerated people. So this, this bill really decouples the criminal justice system from what we believe to be a fundamental right. Uh, I want to supplement that. Um, thank you so much for that. And DCR completely shares that same perspective that housing is a fundamental right. And it's really the touchstone from which uh, uh, individuals are able then to access other aspects of their life, like employment or education for their children, transportation, health. And really to have the housing in place is a critical thing. So then the individual can then participate in other elements of this their, their life. Um, and without that housing being that first stable force, it's extremely and exponentially more difficult to access those other resources. Yeah, I also was going to um, add to that. I think one very important aspect that is oftentimes somewhat overlooked um, when it comes to the Fair Chance and Housing Act is that nothing in the Fair Chance and Housing Act requires housing providers to consider an applicant's criminal history. But when a housing provider chooses to do so, that's when the processes and guidelines laid out under the Fair Chance and Housing Act and its rules, that's when they apply. So I did just uh, think that was uh, important to mention. Yeah, that is really important. Um, in doing this work and enforcing the Fair Chance and Housing Act, we've, as the director indicated, taken quite a bit of proactive uh, measures to enforce the law by identifying housing providers that maintain policies that were um, not in compliance with the Fair Chance and Housing Act and working with them to educate and remediate their policies and procedures to bring them in compliance with the law. And in talking to them about the law and the objectives, sometimes we do see, you know, that they ultimately say, you know, well, we're actually taking this completely out of our evaluation process. We're not going to even be proceeding with an evaluation of criminal history any longer. Um, and that could be a reaction to hearing some of the, like, the statistics about um why this law is in place and the impact that criminal screening does have on certain populations and or it could be a reaction to the fact that you know there's a lot of these procedural requirements and then they ultimately come to the realization that performing that criminal background check is not really giving them critical information on making a housing determination the way that other factors really can give that information resources to them. Thank you all. I think we touched upon really, I think, key parts of the discussion about how um, housing is very important when it comes to people's being able to financial st stability, but also people who are, have past criminal history, how housing is a key part in them moving on to their next phase of life. Like that we touched upon how um, background and criminal history check is not required. It's something that um, landlords can opt in, but if they do so, um, like as Ms. Lane had gone over, there's a process that they have to follow along um, and things that they can look at and things that they can't. Um, I think you mis mentioned this, Ms. Lane, um, in your beginning um, discussion when you talked about um, different criminal histories that are exempt from it um, or ones that are not considered. Can you touch upon that, the ones that are exempt from the law, but also maybe even some criminal history um, that's not looked at at all. Now, you don't have to go into depth on all of them, but just like maybe some. Sure. So um, as Mr. Green pointed out, uh, a housing provider is not required under this law to engage in a criminal history um, review of a housing applicant. However, if they do choose to do so, um, they have to follow the framework set forth by the law. Um, however, there are certain uh, records that can never be reviewed at any point in the process, and those are um, even before or after a conditional offer for tenancy, and those are arrests or charges that have not resulted in criminal conviction, expunged convictions, ev convictions erased through executive pardon, vacated and otherwise legally nullified convictions, juvenile adjudications of delinquency, and records that have been sealed um, so it's aware that housing, it's important that housing providers are aware of this prohibition, that they cannot look at those types of records at any point in the process. Um, and even if a the, even if a housing provider is utilizing a third party vendor and that vendor um, to engage in the eligibility screening for the applicant and that vendor provides them with those records or information, a housing provider still should not be relying upon that information. 
And I think that comes from an understanding that those records are inherently unreliable in making a determination of whether or not a person even engaged in the criminal activity to begin with, and whether or not that person would present any danger whatsoever to um, tenants or others in, in connection with their tenancy. Thank you for that. Um, in addition, um, we talked about how um, landlords, if they do consider um, criminal history, it has to be after the um, conditional letter. Um, so um, how does that impact um, landlords um, and how does that impact tenants? I know you mentioned some landlords that might even change when they look change even looking at criminal history, but can you talk about the impact it has on landlords and tenants? Right. So we talked um you know about the a little bit about the impact on tenants and I would love to hear more from the other panelists on that point as well just uh, ultimately how we see this law being implemented and as it relates to its goals of reducing barriers to housing um, and ultimately reducing recidivism for individuals who are released from incarceration and um, you know, working on keeping families together, not splitting up the families. So I, I want to hear more from the other panelists on that um, as it relates to the impact on the landlords. Um, well, first, I think a, the, a landlord really needs to do a careful consideration and review of the policies that they currently have in place um, that govern uh, screening and eligibility for housing. They need to take a careful look at their applications to ensure that they're not asking any prohibited questions on the initial application. They need to take a careful look at their advertisements um, for housing that they're posting or making available to the public to ensure that it's not making any discriminatory statements, um, or excluding you know, people with certain types of records. Um, and housing providers really need to also, they, they should take a careful look at the resources DCR has put together um, there's been a lot of focus on developing these resources to assist housing providers. We have a model disclosure statement. Um, so that disclosure statement has to be provided to uh, applicants if a housing provider is going to be engaging in criminal history review. Uh, the disclosure statement essentially provides notice to the applicant that this is that the housing provider is going to be looking at that information and they have right to present evidence of inaccuracies in that information and evidence of their mitigation and rehabilitation. Uh, so it's providing that right on the onset so an applicant understands basically what the screening process is going to look like and allows them to sort of get on the front end and begin preparing their evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation uh, that they want to present if it comes to that point. So it allows just a really upfront uh, disclosure no, uh, requirement. Um, then the housing provider, after providing that disclosure, they engage in analysis of any other elements of tenancy that they're going to be utilizing. Uh, if that includes looking at um, you know, credit or income or uh, uh, any other factors that they're looking at for suitability, um, and that needs to be done in accordance with the New Jersey law against discrimination as well. I know that's not the topic for today's conversation, but um, all those other factors should be uh, in compliance with the LAD as well. Um, and then the housing provider can make that conditional offer for housing. Once that conditional offer is expressed, the housing provider can then engage in that review of criminal background. If the, if the housing provider is going to be withdrawing a housing offer based on the results of that screening, they have to provide a notice of withdrawal, and that notice has to be detailed and include a review, specifically an individualized assessment of that person um, and several factors that the law requires to reach a substantial, legitimate, non-discriminatory interest for that withdrawal of housing. Then it allows some additional due process protections for the applicant to dispute that through an appeal process and also have the right to review uh, any evidence that the housing provider review, looked at in making that determination. So that individual applicant has that full transparency to know exactly what the housing provider looked at in reaching their decision and an opportunity to appeal that decision and present their evidence of rehabilitation and mitigation. 
Thank you. And I want to ask uh, Mr. Williams, um, what impact have you seen that the law has had um, on individuals um, through your organizations or community? How has this law impacted um, individuals seeking housing? Um, it's it's been it's been a beacon of hope, um, if you will. I mean, I think that there's still a tremendous amount of education and outreach that needs to be done about uh, about this piece of legislation and really uh, dismantling the stigmas that go along with um, the criminal background check. Uh, one of the things that I testified on when we were working on this bill was um, how how did landlords rent before like 1995? And I use that because that's when we start, you know, we saw the, the boom of the internet. Um, and I'd, I'd like to believe that if, you know, my, using my colleagues' names, that if Jessica was renting from Jonathan and Jonathan was a landlord here in New Jersey and Jessica just moved from California. I doubt that Jonathan was going to call the clerk of courts in California and ask for a criminal record. Right. You know, in proof of employment, first and last month's rent, give me some references, the apartment's yours. Right. So the internet was supposed to be this tool to make things more effective and efficient, but it's become this barrier. So we're we're really working to kind of allow ourselves to realize that the the internet is new, very new in, in in terms of the scope of how housing has been conducted. You know, for hundreds of years, people have rented rooms, houses, you know, apartments, so forth and so on. The internet has only been around for the last 20, 25, you know, really vastly 25, 30 years. So really letting landlords know that, you know, if you're a longtime landlord, you haven't always had access to criminal background checks. You haven't always had access to, you know, to people's credit scores, right? Like these weren't things that were historically done. You know, my grandmother rented a, a room. She didn't do any of this. You know, I know she didn't, right? So, you know, and there is no data that says that someone that has a criminal record is less likely to pay their rent. So we're we're really still in the process of educating and dis, dismantling the stigma of what it means to be a criminal. Um, and unfortunately, overwhelmingly in the state of New Jersey, that stigma has been attached to, you know, to people of color. Um, so we we really need to do a better job of not having a revisionist view on history and acting, you know, acting like this new process is the only way that it's been done. Um, so I, I think that that's something that myself and other advocates are really encouraging landlords to do and, and really reminding them that you had a process before this came along. Yes, this allows things to be more effective and efficient, but if it becomes to the point a detriment to the communities that you're supposed to serve, then we need to look at how we're actually using these tools. And I did just want to add um, to both um, Ms. Lyon and Mr. Williams, um, um, what they mentioned as far as impacts. And I think what you see um, in understanding even the mission of the Division on Civil Rights here in New Jersey um, to eliminate bias and discrimination, the impact I think it has on landlords in helping New Jersey achieve that goal to eliminate bias and discrimination across the state. I think what the Fair Chance and Housing Act is able to do um, also uh, in regard for the impact to potential tenants because that stigma of the uh, uh, past criminal record, uh, that label is can be a barrier to housing that uh, we heard the director in his introduction state that nearly one third of the adult population in the United States has a criminal history. And if we truly want to uh, reduce crime and reduce recidivism rates, um, and the likelihood that crime occurs again, uh, providing people access to something such as housing uh, in a way where they're not being discriminated um, from housing based on a past criminal record um, that puts them in a better position. So that way um, they can have more law abiding means, uh, not that they didn't have them before, but putting it, them in a position where they can continue a law abiding life. So uh, uh, not having proper access to housing is one of those first steps 
to uh, just having stability in any person's life. Can I just add one, one piece? And Jessica, you did an amazing job of, of laying out the the need for that individual assessment. And, I, and once again, just thinking back on some of the things that I highlighted during um, just the work on the bill. If I told you that you would be renting to a a drug dealing pimp who robbed and stole from people, you probably would have trepidation. Um, but that same person, you know, went on to be this charismatic leader. And then I'm using this example um, from the Black Breakfast Club. You know, in today's society, we'd never allow Malcolm Little to become Malcolm X. You know, in one description, I described a drug dealing, you know, thief of a pimp. And the next, that individual evolved into this charismatic national leader. You know, if I just based it on what you had on paper, and I didn't do that holistic approach, I didn't do that individual assessment, I wouldn't see the transformed individual that's sitting before me. And, and we, we have to realize that, you know, there are a lot of Malcolm Littles that go into these institutions, and there are a lot of Malcolm X's that come out. Um, and I use that example in terms of the evolved person, the growth, the development that people actually have, you know, when when truly rehabilitated. Um, and we we can't take that, you know, for granted, because then that's really not an indictment on housing. You know, once again, another conversation, then we need to talk about, you know, how we improve, you know, the, you know, the correction system. But if they're out, and the state of New Jersey has says they're free and fit to, to be a, a citizen again, then we have to believe that they have done their job and this individual is ready to come home and that there's development, growth, and evolution that exists there. So I, I, I thought that analogy that he provided was very telling because on paper, um, I think a lot of people would grapple with the ability of renting to, to Malcolm Little, um, but I don't think any of us would have had an issue um, renting to Malcolm X, but that comes with evolution, that comes with a conversation, that comes with an individual assessment of understanding like who this person has become, not who they are just on paper. And, and to also add to that, I think that goes back to, um, once again, the director's um, opening, uh, where criminal uh, histories um, and in the impact of communities that have been disproportionately uh, affected, uh, communities of color, LGBTQ plus communities, uh, individuals with disabilities, um, other groups who have been over-policed and over-incarcerated. So um, recognizing these uh, disparate impacts and uh, the Fair Chance in Housing Act uh, actually providing um, um, a methodology to uh, combat the historical nature of that. Yeah, I love that. And thank you for highlighting that because that is such an important aspect of the Fair Chance and Housing Act. And the way that I've sort of seen this play out um, for individuals who have brought claims um, with DCR under the Fair Chance and Housing Act, I have an opportunity to hear their story. And it's never black and white. There's so much nuance um, and so much that people have been through in their lives and the strength that they exhibit in the way that they've overcome challenges that they've paid, have faced in the past is just really moving um, because you get to hear who they are as a person and the work that they've done um, and the challenges that they've just been through. And you just have so much immense respect for people and the way that they can overcome. And then you look at, you know, their families and you realize just the huge impact that this opportunity for housing has on the family as a whole, young children, you know, and where they can live and what they, because where they can live, what the, they can then access and the opportunities that are available to them from there. Um, so it's been like an honor to hear people's story and what they've gone through and just see the efforts that they've undertaken to uh, change, you know, and become a different person. Um, and I've, you know, really enjoyed that aspect of this work. So I just want to bring that to light too. A couple other names, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard of these people, but, you know, Nelson Mandela, criminal record, Rosa Parks, criminal record, John Lewis, criminal record, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, criminal record. I mean, we, we can keep going. Angela Davis, Dr. Angela Davis, criminal record. Like, so, you know, 
by today's society, we, we'd have several Nobel Peace Prize winners like sleeping on the street. So just just one to food for thought about, you know, the, the 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 difference between just looking at the record and not looking at the individual. Thank you. Um, one thing that stood out to me, Mr. Williams, is how you said that um, the Fair Chance and Housing Act kind of provides a beacon of hope. And I liked how you talked about different um, historical figures who we all are familiar with and how um, even they had like a past criminal record, but that's just a small part of all the work um, and history that people they have done. And I think for many people, if they have a past criminal history, that's just a small part um, of who they are. It's not the whole picture and it shouldn't play, play a large role in who they are when it comes to considering housing and also other areas of life. Um, I know we talked about the impact that it has, but I know there's definitely more work that need, needs to be done. And I'll start with Mr. Williams, um, I think because you kind of touched upon it, that there still is more work that needs to be done. Um, what areas do you think or have you seen that still needs to work on or changes that still needs to be done to ensure fair housing and even some of the work that you are working on with Fair um, Share Housing Center. Can you talk about that um, and just explain um, what, more, what more needs to be done and what is going on now that others might want to join if they want to get more involved, um, how they can do that? Uh, sure. Now, I, one, I didn't get a chance to really say, you know, thank you and how much I enjoy working with uh, uh, the DCR team. I mean, they are... Uh, uh, to have a uh, a division that that truly embodies what the title is uh, civil rights is a joy um, and a pleasure to to know that there are individuals within you know state government that truly want to ensure that all people are treated fairly. Um, kudos to to all of you um, in the work that you do. I've enjoyed uh, working with Jonathan. Seems like known each other about a year now. Um, pleasure to meet you, Jessica and Kai. I mean, it's been amazing. Um, and, and all those uh, now, um, Judge Rachel Winter after and um, Sandeep and Aaron. So the team has been amazing. So I you know, wanted to leave with that. And uh, part of our work is knowing that there is an agency that exists that wants to do the work, right? That That wants to be the bad guy. You know, nobody wants to be the bad guy, but I appreciate DCR wanting um, to step in into that role. Um, social uh, lawful income, DCR has done an amazing job of pointing that out, but it still exists, right? It's It's been law, but you're still finding landlords and developers that say no vouchers allowed. So uh, I appreciate the work that you guys are doing there. Um, we're working on a piece of legislation for um, creditworthiness. We're finding that to be um, one of these new evolutionary tactics to discriminate in housing, right? So I no longer, you know, we're talking about the new, you know, Jim Crow and how these these practices evolve. You know, I no longer have to draw the red line. You know, I, I put it on the application. You know, the the credit score is a certain number. You know, that's what keeps you out. Your criminal background, that's what keeps you out. You know, the the we know that New Jersey has a a terrible wealth disparity. So an income barrier, you know, that that keeps you out. So, you know, we're working on a bill to hopefully mitigate appraisal bias in ensuring that people are having access to their generational wealth that they gain through home ownership. Um, and all of these bills are only, we can only really think about them in a in a productive way because we have an organization like DCR that wants to be the teeth. Uh, far too often, communities of color are given toothless bills. And um, that is not something that a uh, fair share housing center um, will support. And far too often, um, agencies, they they punt the responsibility and the opportunity to really fight for those individuals um, that need it. And uh, in the time that I've been here, there really hasn't been a piece of legislation where We've advocated for the division of, of, of civil rights to be a part of um, and your organization has said no. Um, you know, so I, I think from that regard, it's coupled with the vision that we have for reducing the barriers that we find in society. But we can't accomplish that if we don't have agencies like yourselves that actually want to do the enforcement, that want to be that watchdog, that want to bring accountability to these bad actors. So I think that that 
it goes in tandem. Um, I can come up with all the idealistic solutions to these problems, but if there isn't someone that wants to be um, that heavy hand and let black, white, indifferent know that, you know, right is right and wrong is wrong and you can't do this to people, um, then our work really falls short. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to to create up and, and think about these innovative ways of reducing um, these barriers, but I'm more appreciative that um, the Division of Civil Rights is willing to, to step into this fight and truly embody um, what your division's title is in fighting for civil rights. So those are the things that uh, we're, you know, we're working on. Thank you. Definitely important work and a lot still needs to be done. Um, it's great that there are organizations like Fair Share and Housing Center and you yourself, Mr. Williams, who are there to advocate for the change and continue to advocate even um, over time so that we make sure that different laws are being passed and that they're being held and that they're being um, enacted. Um, kind of shift, shift in the direction a little bit. Um, so let's say someone is denied housing because of their criminal history. Um, like this individual who applied for it, they were denied, um, or if they, even if they see a posting that says um, no past criminal histories um, um, do not apply, what can they do? Like what will be their next step to file a complaint? I don't know if Mr. Green can talk about that. Yes, thank you. Um, so essentially, um, the New Jersey Division on Civil Rights, we are charged with enforcing the law against discrimination, um, the Fair Chance and Housing Act, and the Family Leave Act. Uh, the law against discrimination does cover employment, places of public accommodation, and housing, but even uh, another step from that, the Fair Chance and Housing Act. So um, you must submit an intake form on our NJ bias system, which is our uh, bias investigation access system at bias.njcivilrights.gov or by calling, we have a housing hotline at 1-866-405-3050. So um, with uh, our complaint process, in order to file a complaint with DCR, uh, first submitting that intake form and creating an online account uh, to use the online NJ bias um, system and calling that number, uh, the first screen you'll have a few icons that you can click through and on um, uh, there's a walkthrough of how to file as well and even uh, if you're not tech savvy using that um, hotline number uh, intake specialists can help walk you through that aspect so uh, part of that complaint process uh, once the intake is uh, received a dcr investigator will contact you um, to conduct an intake interview to determine whether DCR has jurisdiction over your complaint and whether you're alleging a violation um, uh, that occurred within the past 180 days, uh, which is our uh, statute of limitations. Um, uh, also, DCR will prepare uh, uh, a verified complaint uh, if uh, it does reach that level for your signature. And once a person signs a verified complaint, they uh, are known as the complainant. Uh, DCR will then serve uh, that complaint on the party known as the respondent, which may have violated uh, uh, a person's civil rights and through that uh, allegation. The respondent has a chance to respond with their version of events. Uh, kind of the next step in that DCR then conducts an investigation which may include interviews with you, the respondent, witnesses, uh, reviewing different documents and evidence, photos, uh, video recordings. It is important that you preserve all relevant evidence, including any uh, electronically stored uh, evidence, such as text or email messages, until your, uh, until your case has concluded. And at the end of an investigation, DCR will determine whether, whether there is probable cause to believe a violation of the law occurred. Also, uh, real quick, there is a prohibition on retaliation. So uh, I mentioned there's a statute of limitations of 180 days, but also um, retaliation under the law against discrimination um, um, is prohibited. And um, that is a separate claim. So uh, just distinguishing a person 
could file a complaint uh, against, um, say, the respondent and there not be a finding of probable cause, but the respondent took some type of retaliatory action, um, that could be a separate uh, complaint as well for that um, um, retaliation that was um, uh, alleged. So uh, I did just want to throw that in there as well. Thank you. Um, that's really helpful. I know as like if someone files a complaint, they might wonder, okay, I made a complaint. So what's going on next? Or like what happened? So thanks for going through that as well, Mr. Green, because that I think is helpful for people to even have a better understanding of the process or like even what's being done in the back end. Um, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I guess my other question for you, Mr. Green, is let's say someone wants more information about FCHA or someone wants a more in-depth understanding or um, what are other ways that people can learn more about it or and engage and just find out more information? Most definitely. So uh, we definitely encourage our um, um, www.njcivilrights.gov. Uh, even more specifically, if you put a uh, forward slash FCHA, so njcivilrights.gov slash FCHA. That takes you to our Fair Chance and Housing Act uh, landing page and all of our resources from um, the Fair Chance and Housing Act, the language, our resource documents. And you will notice that even in the chat, chat feature today, some of our resources have been, uh, our resource documents and other information have been dropped while uh, we've been uh, going through our discussion today. And um, uh, our the website has even more resources. and even the walkthrough of filing the complaint um, and just a vast array of information. Also, um, uh, you can contact uh, community relations at njcivilrights.gov to be able to uh, contact our unit uh, under the Division on Civil Rights to um, for any follow-up questions and that type of thing. Although I do know we have a Q&A session coming up here shortly. If, if I may, I just want to um, supplement the process when an individual files a complaint um, under the Fair Chance and Housing Act, because there is another step that can take place that's a little different from when a violation is alleged under the LAD, the Law Against Discrimination. So if um, if an individual submits a uh, intake under the Fair Chance and Housing Act, we go through that same process um, that was really clearly explained by Mr. Green of uh, doing the intake, preparing a verified complaint that alleges what the violations under the law are. Um, and then once that's served upon the respondents under the Fair Chance and Housing Act, there is a 14-day period to cure or resolve that alleged violation. Um, so we get in touch with the respondents um, within that 14-day period, and it allows them an opportunity to try to resolve it entirely. Um, potentially, they're going to reconsider the individual applicant for housing. Um, if there's housing still available, they might reinstate them to a wait list. They may re-engage in an individualized assessment. So depending specifically on what that violation, um, what aspect of the Fair Chance and Housing Act was violated, we can try to work with the respondent within that 14 day period to cure that, um, offer like quicker remedies to the complainant if possible. Now, if it doesn't resolve within that 14 day period, we do proceed through the investigation to reach that um, ultimate determination of whether there was a violation under the law or not. But I did want to just highlight that additional step um, that is there to really on a basis that there's, you know, immediate need oftentimes for housing. And sometimes we can try to, uh, you know, fulfill that for the complainant. Thank you. Um, I guess a follow-up question. Um, I know part of the process, um, I think Mr. Green and Ms. Lane talked about if a complainant files a complaint, it's good to have like the evidence, like any copies of any exchanges that you had. Um, I guess kind of build it on that. Um, I know part of the um, FCHA or part of the guidelines is if someone has a past criminal history, they can also provide um, any documentations or stuff in their support to show a bigger part of their character. What type of material might that be or what type of yeah material that someone might be, would be good to show to also paint a fuller picture of their self when they apply for housing? Okay, so if a 
conditional offer for housing is withdrawn and it's withdrawn um, in accordance with what the housing provider can in fact look at under the Fair Chance and Housing Act, because while we didn't get into the specifics, in addition to setting up this procedural framework, the Fair Chance and Housing Act gets specifically into the type of criminal history that can be relied upon based on when that occurred. So there's specific look back periods tied based on the type of offense um, so if a housing provider is able to rely upon the criminal history and it, they've reached um, this you know, determination to withdraw the conditional offer, that's when the individual applicant could come forward with their evidence of um, inaccuracies in the record. So that can be like, I've seen, you know, someone say like, that was not even me. That was an uncle with the same name as me. So for, in fact, that's an inaccuracy in my criminal record. That's not me. And then they could present also evidence of rehabilitation or mitigation. So, in and this is fairly open. Um, this really can be anything that the individual wants to submit. Um, we've seen letters from uh, parole to indicate that parole has been successfully completed. We've seen um, letters of educational enrollment demonstrating that like an individual is enrolled in an educational program or has been hired um, at an for an employment opportunity. Um, letters from social workers indicating they've completed different trainings or counseling programs that um, they've, you know, that have been helpful for them. Uh, if it's a substance, you know, they can submit um, evidence of completing a substance rehabilitation program as well. It could be references from a prior landlord. It could be a reference from someone in the community that they work with, like an organizational leader. So it's really fairly open. I've even I was just working on a case where the housing provider just wanted an explanation in writing um, that sort of that the individual was offering an explanation of like what happened and explaining that like how they've moved on in their life. Um, so it really is quite broad, and it's just really that opportunity to put together the full picture of what this person has done to overcome some of the challenges and the ways that they've grown and, you know, provide that reassurance and proof that they're not going to be, in fact, a danger to anyone and that they would be a responsible lease adhering uh, tenant. And to just briefly add to that, um, and that was a very thorough um, uh with the housing provider, um, if they did um, choose to um, draw a or decide to withdraw a conditional offer of housing because of an offense in an applicant's background, <laughs> providing that notice of withdrawal, it has to indicate um, specific reasons. And um, uh, the housing provider must perform an individualized assessment of several factors. So. They kind of include the nature and severity of the offense or offenses, the applicant's age at the time of the offense, how recently the offense occurred, uh, any information the applicant provided in their favor since the offense. So kind of what Ms. Lane was touching on that if you provide that documentation, which could show just any more positive things having occurred since that time period in a person's life, um, that that could be um, that. Um, documentation needed. Uh, also, um, if the offense happened again in the future, would it impact the safety of other tenants or the property? Um, what, and really, um, uh, I think uh, Ms. Lane touched on it very uh, well. Um, just with for the housing provider to withdraw the offer of housing, it's necessary to fulfill a legitimate non-discriminatory a non-discriminatory reason. Um, so uh, did, I did just want to add that aspect. Thank you. Um, before we move on to question and answer um, section, my last question for all the panelists, um, is there any last thoughts or important tidbits that you might want to add to the discussion? And also, um, what's one key takeaway that you hope the audience um, is able to take away from this um, discussion? So anyone can hop in and start. Uh, I guess for, for me, um... I think it's just a continued need for education. Um, I think passing the legislation was, um, it may do it, I think it, it sounds a disservice to say that was the easy part, but statewide education is a, is a much heavier lift. 
um, getting this information into the hands of every landlord, every you know person potentially you know returning home, every person that's currently incarcerated, anybody that could be you know affected by this legislation, that takes a lot of work. Um, and I think you know one year later, we we can't rest on our laurels and say that you know because the attorney general's office in DCR has has had some success that you know the work is done. Um, so we continue need to you know work with um, local organizations, you know, like Fair Share, NAACP, you know, church, just whomever, anybody that has access to individuals that meet this population or just individuals that know a person that, that needs to know this information, we have to continue to get the word out. So um, I think the continued push for education and advocacy is uh, is there. Um, and the more we do it, the more success and the impact this uh, this bill will have. And I was just I would just add to um, being able to um, empower yourself most with this information, like uh, Mr. Williams said, the education component and letting others know that these are um, uh, resources that are available. Because in the event that, and even though we don't want these things to occur, in the event um, an incident of bias or discrimination does occur. In this scenario, um, knowing that if you file a report, that can trigger our agency, the Division on Civil Rights, to be able to help you um, get justice in that regard and make sure those uh, violations or alleged violations of one's rights are not ongoing, but the education and awareness component, so that way people know um, uh, this act is a thing that the Fair Chance and Housing Act provides these remedies and provides these processes. Um, so that way we're not even in a place where we have to file a report that people aren't doing these practices. Yeah. Similarly to what you both um, touched on, I wanted to also make everyone aware that DCR has a specific training available on our website for the Fair Chance and Housing Act and other um, and also other housing trainings um, discussing LAD protections. So those are going to get you know a little bit more comprehensive into the elements of the law and how to comply. They're absolutely fabulous trainings. So I encourage everyone to check that out too. Um, and then just you know if you are either someone that works with tenants um, or individuals that are likely impacted by this law, to reach out to DCR and let us know um, how we can work and partner together to bring this information to more people. And um, also encourage people to report and file the intakes with uh, DCR because even if if even if we uh, you know make a determination that there was no violation, there's no probable cause to support a violation under the law. We still gain so much from learning about what happened and seeing it as an opportunity to maybe work with housing providers to uh, remediate other policies and practices and just bring forth that education um, to more people. So that's helpful to us regardless. And we're just happy um, to continue to work with uh, different partners within the state of New Jersey in doing the education that we can. Um, so uh, that's that's just um, a huge aspect of, you know, bringing, bringing these, you know, rights actually forward and making sure people are utilizing that and knowing their rights under the law. So Thank you. Um, now we're going to our Q&A session. Um, if anyone have any has any questions, you can post it in the Q&A chat um, and we'll answer them. Um, if not, if someone has any questions later on, you can always email us um, and we'll get back to you. Um, so just wait a few seconds and see if there's any questions. And in addition, we also posted a survey in the chat. We hope that all the audience members will take the time out and to fill out the survey and just give your quick feedback on the um, on this program and webinar. Okay, there's no questions as of now. I want to thank all the um, panelists, Ms. Lane, Mr. Williams, Mr. Green, and Director Iyer for 
for um, taking their time out of the day to really have a rich and important discussion about the Fair Chance and Housing Act. Um, it's been our one year anniversary. A lot has um, happened. A lot of changes has occurred with it. And there's still more, more work that needs to be done. But I want to thank everyone for participating in it today. Um, if people have farther questions or want to um, learn more about it, you can always visit our website at njcivilrights.gov. Um, you can always call us and email us. I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I hope everyone has a great rest of the day.